Tragedy of General Pike at York by David Hawes. Scene 1, April 27th, 1813, 2 a.m. In a ship's cabin around the American warship USS Madison on Lake Ontario, just off York, the capital then of Upper Canada, Brigadier General Pike, unable to sleep as he waits to command the evasion landing at dawn, flips through a portfolio containing copies of letters that he has sent. He read out one to his long-time patron and superior, Brigadier General Wilkinson, nearly 11 months ago. If we go into Canada, you will hear of my fame or of my death. Pike continues through the letters, reads out another to his father just three days ago. I embark tomorrow in the fleet at Sackis Harbor. If we are destined to fall, may my fall be like wolves to sleep in the arms of victory. Pike begins reciting a third letter from memory. To my dear wife, we attack the dawn. Enter. Lieutenant Fraser, why are you up? I say that book me, sir. A man in the boat has reached us, rowing with muffled oars. One of our agents? He gave the password. He says many in York prefer to be once more under the stars and stripes. So dinner of Dearborn has been told, but our commander is cautious after last year's setbacks at Detroit and Niagara. And all the more cherry because he recalls being captured in the Revolutionary War's unsuccessful expedition to Quebec. The agent warns the British have been rushing in reinforcements. General Chief's spies would have been watching us at Sackis Harbor, ready to embark. What does the agent say of defensive arrangements here? I didn't ask about that. I rushed him here. Send the man in. Remain close by outside. End scene one. Scene two. Five hours later, just after dawn. On the ship's deck, General Pike is passing time with Lieutenant Fraser, discussing Pike's published book about his explorations of the West. You error. I never wrote sublime. My word was sublimity. And I was describing the prairie, not that magnificent peak. At school, your description of Grand Mountain stuck in my mind. My memory is usually more accurate. No matter. We were but exchanging excitable banner as our troops were ashore. Would we were with them, sir, despite General Dearborn ordering you to remain on board until we gained Beachhead. The ship's captain keeps the flatboat waiting alongside for when we can go ashore. The Beachhead won. We will be invincible, sir. By no means. Their western battery is not sighted only to engage our ships. It also commands the approach along the coast road from our landing site to the fort. But he said the western battery is not well gunned. Few cannon, some ancient. Some even without trunnions. So they cannot e be easily elevated to fire. Good. Harder to aim at our ships. And what's more, that smaller gun position farther back towards the fort is abandoned. The final happy news is that General Chief will have at most 700 men, mainly militia and volunteers, some natives, only a few companies of regulars. Whereas all of our 1700 are. Look, the wind is blowing our landing craft further west than planned. There may be problems to address. I need both my aides. I'll fetch Captain Nicholson. Surely by now he's had enough of sitting at the bow watching troops scramble into flatboats. Ah, uh, here he comes. Look, sir, the flash and smoke of musket fire. Battle is joined. My God, I can't stay any longer. Come, jump into the boat. Captain Nicholson, hurry. We're going ashore. They scramble over the rail. End scene two. Scene three. A few hours later, mid-morning. Pike is on the beachhead, <clears throat> consolidating his troops for a further advance. Casualties were minimal, and the foe ran from us. 
No, you saw season regulars retiring in good order, taking a more defensible position. Major Forsyth has his riflemen at the ready. Convey to him that his troops will form our vanguard along the shoreline. There is another matter, sir, if you have time. Our troops have apprehended a lady of the town found observing from behind our lines. I had them, I had them bring her here. I'll speak with the lady. Send Mrs. Powell over. While she and I talk, after you speak to Major Forsyth, tell Captain Anderson the British will likely try to block us at that clearing before we get to the battery. The old French trading post? If Forsyth cannot rush them aside, I'll order entry before it. Now go. Lieutenant Fraser departs as Elizabeth Powell enters. Good morning, madam. General, good day to you. Lieutenant Fraser advises that you were spying on my troops. Ridiculous! I was overrun by your invading horde. How did you come to be in their path? The arrival of your fleet last evening was known. The alarm sounded and our men had to depart. It ruined a dinner party I was having. Had Commodore Chauncey known of your event, he would surely have delayed our arrival. Had you and the Commodore known of come as peaceful visitors, you would have been most welcome at my party. As it is, you are not wanted here, and you should depart. Our departure is more a matter for your Major General Chief. Oh, Roger. You speak as though you know the man. I dined next to him last winter. Stolid and unimaginative as a conversationalist. Roger was born and raised in Boston. But educated in England, so I understand. Quite so. Some feel that at Queenston Heights he was unaccountably slow in engaging his former countrymen after Brock fell. My question remains, why are you at the beach? I went out this morning to see what was happening, to near where your ships were offshore. General Sheaf did not know where we were about to land. Did you plan to advise him? Roger had scouts out. I saw them. I was satisfying my own curiosity. And I see Lieutenant Fraser returning. I shall shortly have to ask you to excuse me. I have an advance to come in. Your aide, General. Yes. Is he not rather slight of bill for a soldier? Lieutenant Ming appeared more suited to his scholarly life of contemplation, but Fraser came highly recommended to join my personal staff, and he has proven eminently suitable. Fraser Andrews. General, all is set. Madam, we will speak more later. Pike moves away from Lieutenant Fraser and Mrs. Powell, draws and raises his sword, and then brings it down briskly in the direction of the march. Forward! Yankee Doodle before. <laughs> I wonder how many men must die for the sake of this spirited rendition. End scene three. Scene four. A couple of hours later, about noon. Pike is using a telescope to observe the artillery battery position along the edge of Lake Ontario, west of York Blockhouse. Lieutenant Fraser arrives, somewhat out of breath. Fraser, after our ships bombarded the battery a while back, it ceased firing. Did you see what was happening inside? I climbed a tree. The men inside were spiking the only two guns still able to fire, making ready to pull out. Major Forsyth is bypassing, but Captain Wadsworth's company is moving to picket them. Suddenly, there's a bright flash. Smoke billows above the battery. Great God, what happened? That's... Sir, there was much confusion inside the battery. <coughs> Troops running about. Some were shifting an artillery ammunition wagon. That would be it. Some careless gunner dropping a flame or spark or lighting fuse on open powder. Redcoats are stumbling out. Pike again uses his telescope. Many with dire wounds. Fraser peers about. Look, sir, some flee ahead of Forsyth's rifles. They can go. Wadsworth will take those who surrender and aid the wounded. We'll continue advancing toward the blockhouse itself. Mrs. Powell arrives. A guard turns her over to Lieutenant Fraser. What are you doing here, madam? General, 
Uh, I request you to be brought here to ask your permission to treat the wounded from the landing and the fight at the clearing. That explosion now will have injured many more. Madam, I perceive you as coming from the better elements of York society. Well-meaning ladies of quality can render but little assistance to badly wounded My soldiers. My husband is a medical doctor. After our marriage, I frequently assisted, assisted him in his practice, including amputations, and caring for patients after surgery. Very well. Lieutenant Fraser will take you to our officer in charge at the site of the blast. I am wondering, madam, would you offer medical assistance to wounded American troops? Why wouldn't I? End scene four. <laughs> Scene five, a couple of hours later, early afternoon. Pike is a few hundred yards from the blockhouse at Fort York. With him are Lieutenant Fraser and a prisoner, a Canadian sergeant. No sign of defenders, but their flag still flies. Captain Nicholson has brought their Canadian prisoner, sir. All right. Now, Sergeant, what can you tell us about things at the blockhouse? Of that I know nothing. You're lying. Not so. My troop arrived a few days ago. I know not of that structure. We camped elsewhere. You can't even tell us what's that lowstone building just outside the palisade? Perhaps a field latrine? Fortunately, I don't need to go. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you do today? This morning, we were sent to oppose your landing. Were you taken to the beach? No, that fight was lost before we arrived. We were then ordered to skirt your advancing force, cut around back to the battery to take a stand there. But when we got there, the gunners were about to depart. Indeed, yes. Now I remember. I saw you at the battery. You and others in Scarlet stood apart from the men striking the guns. They were blue. We are infantry, not gunners. Our uniforms differ. When the powder blew, I was stunned. Your troops came up as I lay there. Hold on. I see movement, well behind the blockhouse, towards the town. Pike raises his telescope. Troops moving. Regulars by their uniforms and gate. Damn! Chief has pulled out, yet left their flag up to trick us. Pike gives a sudden start as there's a brilliant flash of light. Smoke and debris tower into the sky. That building was a magazine Chief has blown. Bastard! If you don't like the way a people fight, stay out of their country. Mm. A Fraser looks up. Rubble, the air is filled. Look out. A shower of blast shattered rock falls. <laughs> the pike is struck by a jagged piece and drops gravely wounded. Fraser looks around desperately. Send a surgeon. Our general needs help. End scene five. <laughs> scene six, an hour or so later in the afternoon. Pike lies on the deck of the USS Madison, his head upon a folded Union Jack. Lieutenant Fraser enters. Fraser. Good to see that you survived that blast. The Canadian sergeant's body shielded me, sir. He died, as did Captain Nicholson. What's that you lie upon? It looks... You know, Dearborn gave me the Union Jack. Our troops tore from the blockhouse uh, to serve as a pillow. It grieves me to find you sung so low. I'll soon sink lower than just a fate. Nineteen years a soldier got to die afloat to meet Davy Jones in Canadian waters. No, sir. Commodore Chauncey decrees that Navy will bury you to Sackett's Harbor for a decent burial. Mrs. Powell enters, carrying a ladle filled with water. She kneels and helps Pike drink. How is it that you're here, Miss, Mrs. Powell? Soldiers carrying General Pike past where I was treating earlier wounded asked me to assist, <coughs> and so I came aboard. Another of those mistakes dotting your path today? Commodore Chauncey stood by as we boarded. He accepted my explanation, I, and I will be rowed to the town once more, once I am done here. Which will not be long, but I thank you, madam. Mrs. Powell's gracious assistance has been much comfort to me, Fraser. 
It is fitting that I help a stricken countryman. Uh, there you are, madam. I am no British subject. Old habit. I misspoke. I meant former countryman. Are you? I was born in Albany, married in Stillwater, somewhat north, where I read your book, General, before my husband and I moved to Canada. I always wanted to see that great mountain you wrote of. Now travel in war, make its enemies. How sad. And how needless. Forgive my lacking energy to debate that, madam, but ironic that as did Fraser this morning, you remember my writing about that gigantic rock, where now a tiny chunk of masonry does me in. Last night, I wrote to my dear wife, should I fall, let me believe I aspired to deeds worthy of your husband. Your glory will be as wolf, sir. Or Brock's. Now fades the glimmering landscape on the sight. Though yet once more in my mind's eye, I see that greatest peak. Pike dies. He's gone. Quoting Gray's elegy. He told me how he greatly admired the General Wolf, reading it aloud as they rode him to Quebec. And now I must take my leave of you. I have to report the General's death to Commodore Chauncey. Of course. And, and would you be kind enough to convey to the Commodore that I am ready to be rowed back to shore? Of course. Lieutenant Fraser turns to go. Thank you, Miss Fraser. Fraser stops and turns to stare at her. What? What did you just call me? Did you really think that I could not see from the start that you are a woman disguised in a man's uniform? You have re-entered my mind. No, did, you, did you tell anyone? I saw nothing to be gained by it. I do admire your courage, and I wish you a safe and speedy return to, to my former country. The end. Mm -hmm.